This is StoryBeat, storytellers on storytelling. An exploration into how master storytellers and artists develop and build brilliant stories and works of art that people everywhere love and admire. So join us as we discover how talented creators of all kinds find success in the worlds of imagination and entertainment. Here now is your host, Steve Cuden. Thanks for joining us on StoryBeat. If you like this podcast, please take a moment to give us a rating or review on whatever app or platform you're listening to. Your support helps us bring more great StoryBeat episodes to you. My guest today, Vicangelo Bullock, has produced international co-productions for Warner Brothers International based out of Paris. He executive produced the 2016 Democratic National Convention. He recently produced the indie feature, Windows on the World, starring Edward James Olmos and Ryan Guzman. He's a creative executive with over 20 years experience in the development and execution of programming, events, and initiatives focused on the multicultural audience and marketplace. He opened the Hollywood Bureau of the National NAACP, becoming its first executive director. The executive produced the NAACP Image Awards for 15 years. He also served as the Managing Director of Outreach and Strategic Initiatives for the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. For the record, Vic and I have known one another for more years than either of us will admit, going back to our days in theater school at the University of Southern California. For those reasons and many more, I'm truly thrilled beyond words to have my friend Vic Bullock on StoryBeat today. Vic, welcome to the show. Hey, Steve. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Glad oh, it's, it's really my pleasure and honor. Trust me. Okay, so let's go all the way back to the beginning. What were your sort of earliest inspirations and influences? What was your first creative love and how did you get into this thing of writing and producing? How did that happen? I really, you know, I really don't know <laughs> uh, because I start as the king and the emperor has no clothes in like the sixth grade. Yeah. Uh, I used to do a Christmas plays with my sister as Scrooge, uh, like in the theater. I think part of it is probably, um, my dad was in the military. Yeah. And so we traveled a lot. And whenever I traveled or whenever we moved, the artistic community and those kids kind of became my immediate group of friends. I think part of that is, you know, I was athletic, you know, I played sports and stuff like that. But also um, for, for, your, for your listeners, and especially when you talk about multicultural, you know, I'm biracial. My dad's African-American. My mom's white, European, mm-hmm. little French farm girl. Um, and I think um, because of that, I was, when I was looking for new groups of friends, the groups that I would be drawn to, it was based, again, you know, on on art or some other facet other other than finding a, a click, you know, so to speak. So in other words, there was some point where the hook got set in you where you went, wow, this is what I want to do. Do you recall a- approximately when that happened? Was it when you were in high school or before? Or, I, you went to theater school at USC, so you must have known something prior to that. Oh, yeah. No, it's, um, uh, again, when I said I don't know, it's because I, I feel like it's always been with always. Me in some sense. Um, I think one of the, you know, and as you get older, you reflect. Uh, I think one of the uh, pivotal moments was eighth grade choir. Um, we were doing snippets out of musicals. And I think I yawned. <laughs> and the, <laughs> the music teacher asked me um, if I was bored. And I said, yeah, I find this kind of boring. And she said, do you think you could do better? And I said, yeah, I do. And she allowed me to direct the performance. Oh, wow. What, what, what age were you? At, this was like the eighth grade. Wow. And I look back at that and I go, and, I, and when I tell the story, I keep going, I need to trace it back and get her name because I owe her a huge debt of gratitude because, you know, she could have, you know, she could have handled that a couple of different ways. She could have sent me out in the hall. Yeah. You know, right. But she laid the challenge. And then we did that production um, in front of, as a school assembly. And it was very, 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 very successful. And I don't think I ever, you know, got a great response. And uh, I don't think I ever looked back. 
you know i mean i was like oh this is duck to water <laughs> you, you you got it as it did for me at an early age it got into your blood and once it was in your blood you've never gotten it out of your blood exactly it's exactly like the, the worst kind of addiction ever <laughs> oh yeah no because then again my dad was in the military and it wasn't what he perceived would be my my trajectory oh sure i'm sure <laughs> definitely yeah definitely not the theater which yes. is you know so all right so when did you start to write when did you think yeah i really like this i'm going to start to write have you always been a reader were you always a writer i've always also i actually i, I consider writing my real foundation sure um, and that's how we all knew you mainly at school. You were, you were a playwright. No, thank you very much. Yeah. And I, and I, and I, and I, and I tell you when people ask me, because, you know, I've done different things as, as most of us do, if you have a, a, an interesting career, th you know, that, you know, writing is my foundation and that's what got me here, you know, yeah. but I wrote, you know, probably like most people who write, I started with poetry, you know, did songs. I think I wrote my first play in like the 10th grade and was, again, in this name I do remember, um, Mr. Gordon, uh, or Gordon Albert, I should say, at uh, my high school drama teacher at, uh, at Lake and Heath, American High School in England. Uh, I, was, I was primarily an actor, you know. I mean, he cast me as Oscar in The Odd Couple. I mean, you know, just stuff that people would like, you got to play that, you know. Um, I played JB in Archibald McLeish's uh, JB. Right. Um, I have a hard and, time um, picturing you as Oscar. I know, I know. <laughs> uh, and, um, and because of that, and I guess for your listeners, I, I read a lot. Yeah. If you talk about the process, I've, you know, and really loved it. I was a kid who would you know, also just go sit in the library. I've read all of Shakespeare, you know, the histories, the comedies, the dramas, and the sonnets, you know. I've read all of Ibsen, all of Chekhov, all of Eugene O'Neill, all of George Bernard Shaw. Mm. Um, you know, I was just a voracious reader. This is while you were still in high school? This is while I was in high school. You were way ahead of the curve. You know, and um, well, and part of it was by whatever junior high school, and again, because my dad moved, you know, we were in California. So I, we were up in Northern California and I was on my way to you know, being a kid who might, you could find on at the Haight-Ashbury. Um, <laughs> then my dad got transferred to England and um, I, I lived in a dorm and I literally had study hall from like every night from like 7.30 to 11 o'clock. Right. And I had, to, I had to sit at a desk with my door open and with hall monitors walking by. And there was only so much screwing around you could do before you'd finally go, well, I should do my homework and I should read. And then again, you know, uh, Gordon Albert, my high school drama teacher was obviously just very open-minded, very ahead of his time and um, uh, very inclusive. And uh, again, gave, gave me a home because, you know, if I was in the library, I'd be sitting in the theater reading and, and then learning everything about theater too, right? Uh, Lighting so, and set design. And, sure. Well, and right. And then you learned even more when you got to USC because then oh, you absolutely. focused on it. And, absolutely. and uh, as I look back on our education at USC, it was actually pretty, pretty fundamental for a lot of people, that particular education. We learned a lot about a lot. And I think Absolutely. what we learned the most about that I think is the most helpful is how to collaborate, how to be together, how to work in groups. We did lots of shows. Um, all right. So school is school. Let's go beyond that. How did you, um, once you left school, how did you find your first paying assignment? How did you start into the business where you were making a career out of it? Well, I was actually really, really lucky in that, um, as you know, I was doing plays, you know, writing plays and having them produced at, at USC. Correct. Uh, which still are some of my fondest memories, you know, of, of, of all time. And, you know, some extremely talented people. And I'm glad many of them have continued. And Still and, working. And, Lots of those people still are still working. working. And uh, have had, uh, you know, good, good careers. A, another writer, a uh, Hollywood writer, came and saw one of my plays and I was hired to write my first screenplay while I was still at USC. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. 
I did yeah. not know that. Who, who, what was it? Who was it? And actually, it was a really great experience, although I didn't know. Um, a gentleman, I don't know if you know a gentleman named Fred Weintraub. Oh, sure. He brought Bruce Lee to America. Right. Um, and he is the producer executive responsible for Woodstock. So those were two major, you know, and he, you know, he was from New, New York. I think he owned the club, The Bitter End. Anyway, uh, at the time, <laughs> all young artists, and he was very open, and uh, he ended up being an executive at Warner Brothers and everything. So anyway, so Fred hired me. I wrote a screenplay, which actually got turned into a movie called Out of Control, you know, and whatever. It was early, that, that phase in the um, late 70s, I don't mean to age myself, but early 80s, uh, where the teen comedies and dramas and all that stuff, so... Um, so did one of those. And then what Fred did is um, he hired me and I basically rewrote his library. Oh, wow. And he would literally hand me a screenplay a week or a screenplay every two weeks and say, what's wrong with this? Can you fix it? At the time, you know, I wasn't covered by the Writers Guild. I wasn't doing anything that I think I was making like $500 a screenplay or something. But I plowed through about, you know, 20, 30 screenplays for wow. him. Well, but what a great opportunity to really learn it. Thank you very much. You know, and, and, and Fred was really, really hard, you know, um, and uh, I'm not going to say. Hard as in he was a tough note giver? Is that what you mean by hard? Yeah, 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 yeah. He was a tough note giver. He really wanted more. I'm not going to say that our store, our, our, our sensibilities were always the same. But what I what I really loved, because because Fred on some levels was a B movie producer, right? But Fred loved the production, and Fred loved getting it done. And so people would complain; they'd say, "Oh, he's this, he's that," you know, and he's a hard taskmaster, and you know, and he's you know he's always looking to get the deal and everything. And I'd be like, "Yeah, but Fred likes to get it done. Fred uh -huh. likes to be in that space, talking to creative people." being on a set, watching it all come together. And I said, and that's, that's what I love. So and you were so, simpatico with him. You were on the same wavelength with him. Absolutely. And, and, and here's a note again for how do you get it done or, you know, your, your trajectory. Um, so that was, like I said, and, and I, you know, I have a story. I mean, Fred actually fired me at one point because we came to a, a creative, creative <laughs> differences. Yeah. Uh, but um then years later, he had a show which was picked up by uh, Warner Brothers International, and um, he he was in. They were in trouble. They had shot four episodes, and it just wasn't gelling, wasn't coming together. Uh, Warner Brothers was talking about pulling the plug on it, and he invited me over as an editor because he'd also, you know, I'd, I'd spent some time in the editing day, and he knew he knew that, and I had my and you know, again, my mother's French. I had my French passport. It was being, you know, this was a show that was being shot in Lithuania, post-production in Paris, post-audio in London. And so because I had my European passport, that made it easy for mm. to insert me also. He invited me over on a six-week contract. I stayed in a hotel room about as big as my desk, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, and um, I, 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 I re-edited and uh, as I was re-editing the first four episodes, I'd also go, oh, can I get a shot of so-and-so off in the distance so I can put these words in their mouth? Because, you know, they were still shooting the episodes. So we did that. He resubmitted those four episodes. The studio said, hey, I don't know what you're doing, but this is great. We're good. And then Fred brought me on as a producer. And then, you know, then I produced two seasons of, uh, of that show. Wow. So th there was no... There was no planning to get to the path that you were on. You're, the path sort of just unfolded before you. Absolutely. And that's, you know, that's the thing I, you know, uh, 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 again, you know, and I, and I really hesitate because, you know, the path for everybody is so different. Different. Yeah, it um, is. And I just tell everybody, you know, what you really have to do is just be open to it, you know. And, you know, you, there are moments where, you'll have more than one choice. You know, sometimes you have no choice. <laughs> you got to eat and here's what at least immediately sure. seems available and viable. And sometimes you have choices and, you know, you pick paths and they, you know, they take you different, different directions. But I want the listeners to be, be very cognizant of the fact that 
Vic had worked his way to that. It didn't just, he just didn't walk out on the street one day and Fred Weintraub said, hey, you come here. Um, he had spent a lot, Vic had spent a lot of time writing and writing and writing and doing shows and working on things. And you had a pretty good, solid foundational understanding of a lot of things before you got to that point. Oh, absolutely. And, 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 and again, as a, and I'm, this, I'm not advocating this for anybody, but um, you know, I've always been one, I'm like, I cross bridges, I don't burn them. And okay. sometimes I'll cross a bridge and I'll run across the field, into the forest, across the lake, and never look back. And sometimes I've had to come back and retreat a, a, across the bridge. And Fred Weintraub is a perfect, perfect example of that because, you know, obviously when he was um, educating and taking advantage of me as a young writer, um, uh, on some levels I didn't know better and I was just appreciative because, hey, I'm making some bucks. And, uh, and I'm doing what I love. Um, and, um, but, you know, I eventually figured that out. I was like, wow, I should have been making thousands of dollars. You well, know? well, but it, it, that's right. But at the but same, it came back, but it came back around. Sure, sure it did. Uh, obviously it paid off huge, but the, the, uh, here's the interesting thing is you didn't go to cinema school. You went to theater school. So your training was not in how, what are you supposed to do on a film set? So you were learning, you were, you went to the school of hard knocks and learned how movies were made, movies and TV. Right. Actually, when I was at USC, I was in a program called interdisciplinary majors. Oh, is that right? And so it was theater. So I got to take theater classes, film classes, journalism classes, and philosophy classes. Those Slacker. Were the, those were the ones <laughs> that I, that I had. And so what I, uh, you know, my, my process, which, in some ways, I, you know, I didn't conceive it at the time, but I, it's, 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 it's pretty much held in a lot of ways through my whole life. My process for getting through school was um, I would write a play, would produce the play, and I, you know, and I had the advisors, including in the theater department. Sure. Um, I'd write a play. Um, I would um, usually try to videotape or shoot that play in some form for mm -hmm. archival purposes. And then I would have to write a paper about why I chose that subject. And that's kind of you know, how, I, how I went through school. That is, uh, I, you, I don't think you were in, were you intending it to be so well-rounded or did it just happen that way? It just kind of, it just kind of happened that way. Um, I was um, on my way to being in cinema school mm -hmm. or, or theater, because uh, I, I really love the theater. I actually thought that was, I, I love the theater. I thought that's where I was going to, you, know, you and me both. I mean, life in the theater. That's, I don't think anybody, here's my opinion. I don't think anybody can ever go wrong with training in the theater. If absolutely. you, if you want to be in show business of any kind, training in the theater is about as good as it can get. And yeah, then you I, can go learn those other things. No, I think it's, uh, I, I actually think that if you haven't done some time in the theater, you don't really, you haven't, you know, even if you're an actor, you know, you're lucky, however you got in, um, or, you know, or, or director, anything, if you haven't spent some time in the theater, you, you, you're not going to reach your full potential. Uh, that, because, may, that may be true. Yeah. You know, because the, you know, the, um, 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 and I, and I mean, you can, you can be Steven Spielberg or Alfred Hitchcock. And I would say, even if they spent time in the theater, who knows, I think they would have found another gear, another, <laughs> another thing. Um, you know, because it's not all about success, right? Just, uh, Absolutely. In, in, so in, in, so, in so you've, you've made a mark in theater, TV, and film. You've made marks in all of those mediums, disciplines, whatever you want to call them. Um, do you have one that you prefer, or are they just all of a piece? They're kind of all of a piece. I, 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 and again, I just, um, um, you know, this, the, 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 the play I did last year, reminded me how much I love the theater. Well, tell the listeners what that play was and what, what, what well, The play was called um, Paradise, uh, a beautiful play written by uh, Laura Marie Sensabella, um, who is a phenomenal uh, playwright, you know, went to the Yale School of Drama. So she didn't write a great play by accident, as you were saying, yes. you know, everybody logs in the hours. Um, and it's a, it's a two-hander. Um, I was looking for a I was looking for something to direct as an indie film because um, that's currently, you know, the space I've been enjoying. Um, and so I read a bunch of plays and I read this play and it was about a young 
a Muslim girl um, who wants to high school senior, run down school in, in, in the Bronx, who wants to study science. Um, she's a devout Muslim, um, hijab, and she's uh, of the Yemeni culture, and sh she's in an arranged marriage. Um, so the play starts with her going in and petitioning her um, high school science teacher to do, a, uh, to do a makeup on a quiz that she just failed. He doesn't want to be bothered. He sees that she has gotten, you know, he looks up her grades and sees she's got nothing but straight A's in his class and pretty much just straight A's through high school. And she might actually be a genius. Right. And she found out something about her betrothed. And so she fell off her game. And that's why she got an F on this t test. Then we find out about him that he was also a wunderkind. Um, and he was studying, uh, he was doing research at the university level, had a fall from grace, and now finds himself teaching high school science. Wow. And so it's about their relationship. And it's a two-hander. And so it was basically two actors on stage for two hours. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, and I had to keep that moving without it looking like it was just moving to move. It's and, very hard to keep interest with just two people there. Uh, and um, we ran for three months, sold out audiences, standing ovations, every, every performance except one. And I mean that literally. And that one was a Sunday matinee, um, basically uh, with a bunch of, and, and I don't say this with any disrespect, but with a, with a, with a bunch of, um, with an older audience. Yeah. And some of whom couldn't stand if they wanted to. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you had them. You had them captured. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, All right. So anyway, so, and so now we're developing that. Um, Viola Davis and her husband were my producing partners. Nice. On that, and uh, we're now developing that uh, as an indie feature, and we're actually gearing up, and we're looking at going into production um, in April of this year. So, so does uh, it does it does it help you in the process when you have someone who's a well-established name? Does that help, or does it is it meaningless? I'm sure you've heard. There's now we're talking kind of specifically, at least this adage in film. You know, there's the old adage. You know, you make a film three times when you write it, when you shoot it, and when you edit it. Right. I you know I've been telling people no 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 you make it four times because you write it, you shoot it, you edit it and you sell it yeah <laughs> and selling and marketing is a whole performance art <laughs> of its own and without it you really don't have a, a useful way to get to people absolutely and that's where the names come in right where you know they hear oh whatever in this case you know viola davis and so they're attracted and and that then helps you in terms of um she then becomes sort of the person that that uh, leads the charge for interviews and that kind of thing because the people want to talk the the interviewers want to talk to her because she's known just simply because right, she's a celebrity. Right, but 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 in this in this case, not that she was a a, a silent partner, but you know she's really busy, <laughs> so she was on a lot of film sets. So it was more her and her husband Julius Tennant, who you know was really in the trenches with me and is, is a major creative in his own right. Right. Well, and I guess I have to back up because I had just come off of a run, you know, because I did the civil rights work for 15, and, 20 and we're, years. And we're going to get to that in a moment. But okay. Yeah. But I, so this play was me kind of still in the process of coming out and not being just thought of as that civil rights guy. Right. You were rebranding yourself a little I bit. I was rebranding myself. And so they, as... Um, friends and fellow creatives and they you know knew from conversations and we've known each other um and and my sense of material and the types of stories i wanted to tell they were they 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 graced me with their support well you know uh that's a that's a wonderful thing and again uh, that didn't happen out of the blue either it took you years of of working in whatever world you, worlds you were in in Hollywood in order to make those connections in order to get that opportunity. So, 
it's a, a linked chain. I always think of it as a, 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 the linkage is one to the other, to the other, to the other. And without those first links, you don't get the later links at all. So right. I, I think it is one, one series of steps. So, all right, let's, let's talk about the movie you recently produced, Windows on the World. How did that come about? That came about because, uh, again, when you talk about links, um, a, a friend, Robert Mailer Anderson, he, uh, we met in political circles um, and you know, we were involved in some, um, some, 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 some political campaigns, um, as is the case also with Edward James Almos, who's the star of the film. Right. Um, you know, we literally met in, you know, doing marches and stuff like that. Wow. Um, and um, so Robert was a good friend of um, Benjamin Jealous. I'm, and I'm going to say this, and I'm going to give names because I, I like what you were saying about the links. Yeah. And you don't, and you don't know. You, you, know, you're you, out you and never, you never know. That's why, that's why you are so smart to say you don't burn bridges because you don't know. Absolutely. And I wanted, because there was another thought I wanted to add to that. There was another uh, friend who was very successful, uh, who basically told me at one point, gave me some early advice. He said, look, I've gotten some of the, my best deals in life from people who initially screwed me over. <laughs> <laughs> he said, because if you keep doing what you're supposed to be doing and you are who you are, you know, they'll, they come around, they recognize it. And then they, on top of it, feel guilty. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know and they want to make right you know so i, I love uh, the concept of do what you do yes do, do what you do do don't do what other people do do what you do absolutely absolutely okay, so sorry so, so you, robert sorry. baylor so benjamin jealous who was president of the naacp right the youngest president ever and it's, uh, well, i was doing my politics um was friends also with robert mailer anderson um i didn't know robert um was creative at the time and he had a movie um, a, a low budget thriller horror movie called Pig Hunt. And um, um, Ben asked me if I'd go see the movie and watch it and if there was any advice or any insights I could give Robert in regards to Hollywood. Cause you know, I was running the Hollywood Bureau had all these relationships or have all these relationships. And um, you know, I watched the movie and um, there wasn't a lot I could, I mean, it was, it was a horror movie about a man eating pig. <laughs> <laughs> aren't they all <laughs> you know, exactly. and so uh but anyway through that robert and i kind of struck up a friendship and you know kind of wanted to work together and he then said i've got this other script that you know i've always loved and that had been in development um um at miramax and all this other kind of stuff and you know now it was buried in a box somewhere and and i said you know and he pitched it to me you know, about this young Latino kid whose father was an undocumented worker um, at the top of the World Trade Center. Right. In the restaurant, Windows of the World. And I was like, wow, I love that. Can I read it? And so he sent it to me. I read it. And Robert is really a very, very talented writer. And on some levels, I think, you know, um, as he continues, is an important writer. He also wrote a, a book called Boonville, right. um, which uh, uh, did very well um, as an author. And um, so, you know, then we, we you know, we kind of started the journey. Now, Robert is also lucky in that he is, uh, knows all the tech people and is in one of the tech families in, in Northern California. Okay. And so- You're talking about um, computer tech. Computer tech, exactly. Got it, got it. Exactly. And so, you know, we put together, we put together a team, you know, we got Edward James Almost, we got um, Ryan, there were a couple of other actors early on that because the scheduling didn't happen. And, you know, so we had this whole thing. And then essentially Robert went out and got the money so that we could uh, shoot the film. And it was a once in a lifetime kind of uh, opportunity in the sense that we didn't have, we were just told, to go make the best movie possible right. that we could make. Sure. And also it was, again, because we both came from the political space, it was just, we felt, you know, it was an important story to tell. Um, as much as Hollywood talks about diversity and the Wanda diversity, it really is ghettoized in a lot of ways still. Mm -hmm. And um, 
you know, nobody was jumping up and down to want to tell a story about a young Mexican kid whose father disappears after 9-11. Um, but, uh, um, you know, we had a passion for wanting to tell the story. And uh, so we did, and it's done really well on the festival circuit. Currently it's streaming on um, 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 a streaming service called VIX and Pangalo. And those are streaming services that um, are targeted to the Hispanic diaspora. Is, is VIX V-I-X? V-I-X. V-I-X, good. And Pangalo, P-A-N-G-A-L-O. Okay. Um, and uh, again, they, you know, are targeted for the Hispanic diaspora. It, it, so it, it's in English, yes? It, you can watch it on Pangalo. You can watch it in English and in Spanish. Okay. Because what they did for the Spanish market is they put, you know, um, in our ver in the in the in the version that did the film festival circuits, all that it's in English and Spanish. Nice. You know, and then for the Spanish Hispanic market, um, they uh, dubbed it all in um, in Spanish. Got and it. I have to say, it was an interesting process. I was only tangentially involved in it, but you know, watching it, some of the um, voice casting that was done, you know, I mean, I was like, these, these, these actors are like, <laughs> you know, they're in it, you know, <laughs> you, can, you know, how do you, well, there's crying. So let me make sure I get that quick. Cause I was concerned, right. You know, right. I was going to undermine because the performances are, are, uh, we got some great performances and, um, um, Edward James almost is our star and, um, uh, Michael almost is our director, his son. And, I always just loved the idea when we were putting it together, when Robert and I, because Robert was my producing partner on it, um, the idea of a son directing his father in a movie about a son looking for his father. Um, that's uh, like, yeah, I was like, if that's not an entertainment tonight moment, I don't know what it, it is. Exactly. Yeah, that's exactly. So it, so you did not release it theatrically. You went straight to streaming. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and we, we were, we, we actually were, Looking at um, a theatrical window, March, April of this year. Oh well, which, yeah, yeah. But because so, we're, when we're recording this, for the record, it's uh, May of 2020, in the middle of the COVID pandemic, and so March, April of this year were um, a washout for the entire world. Exactly, <laughs> and exactly. especially especially anyone doing the the theatrical anything, whether it's right. li live theater, legitimate theater, or movies or whatever. Nobody was coming together at all. Um, and also to keep that film in context real quick, thank you, Steve, um, is we're this weekend coming up will be our third weekend streaming. And we were the number one movie on that VIX platform wow. the last two weekends. Well, so, that well, that's something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, and again, it's such an underserved market. Um, and some of the diversity stuff, um, I tell people, you know, it's at times, it's like bringing water to the desert. You sure, know? sure. And um, so, uh, but again, you know, it's all, it's all about marketing. You know, um, I'm convinced um, uh, if we, um, you know, could have sustained um, and, 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 and built a, a, a bigger marketing platform that this, 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 this film, um, you know, this film deserves as wide an audience as, as possible. It really is just filled with some great performances. Ryan Guzman, the kid um, who stars in it, I think is gonna be a superstar. Um, he's just phenomenal. He was a pleasure to work with. He's almost in every scene and he showed up every day with a work ethic that, you know, you just cherish. And, right? and those kinds of reputations in Hollywood are hard to achieve. And when you do achieve them, you, it usually stands people in good stead for an entire career. Absolutely. When and you have, when you have the rep, when you have the reputation of being a good person that shows up and does the work and doesn't complain, usually that person works and works and works. Absolutely. As, as, certainly if you have some talent, I mean, you got to have that yes. too. No, and he does have talent. And, uh, and, and, and Edward James almost has said he thinks it's the most important film he's done and wow. one of his best performances of all time. Well, that's saying something because he's done some good movies and he's certainly a very fine performer. Absolutely. No, he's, he's, he's got a couple of scenes in this that um, I, you know, 
I really think before it's all said and done, we'll go down in cinematic history. Wow. I'm going to be that bold. Yeah. So, so are you, are you starting to push that sort of thing out bits and pieces, clips and so on? Um, yeah, we, you know, there's there, I, I, uh, again, um, Vix and Pongolo and those guys are, 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 are doing the promotion marketing of it. There is some stuff that you can find on YouTube. If mm-hmm. you just do windows on the world. Okay. Uh, um, uh, that, you know, obviously you'll get some stuff on the restaurant, but you'll know, you'll find the movie. Um, and or clips in the trailer of the movie and stuff like that. So I'm very, right. I'm very proud of that film. To be so clear. I want to dig in just a little bit and then I want to move on to the NAACP and I definitely want to um, talk about the DNC as well. Um, uh, so what your function as the producer on the movie, was it more of a creative producer? Was it more of nuts and bolts on the set or was it a combination of things? What was, you, what really was your major function? It was a combination. It was a combination of, of, of the two. Um, Obviously, on the creative, I mean that you know that I bring, having started as a writer and absolutely acting and all that kind of stuff, um, and um, you know, and and this is one, and and also I love the nuts and bolts, right? How do you make your day? How do you you know? And 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 again, it was an indie film, so you know we did the prep that we did, and then there are times, you know, when you're like an hour and a half ahead. Um, and I don't think any of the actors will mind if I use names, but, and you run into circumstances like, um, you know, um, again, in the film, it's a, a, a Nigerian who helps this young Mexican kid off the street by offering right. him a job when he can't find a job in New York. Mm-hmm. So it's a nice, you know, black Brown, um, coalition kind of story. And we had, um, Lou Gossett was supposed to play the role. Okay. And we're very, very excited. And I've known Lou and really wanted to work with him and hopefully would still like to work with him on something. Uh, and he was doing a, an indie film in Ireland and they basically wore him out. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, he, well, he's not a kid anymore. He's not a kid anymore. And he flew back to Los Angeles. He was going to fly back to Los Angeles. And of course, I as a producer like, why don't you just fly to New York and stay in New York and, you know, we'll put you up. But he wanted to go back to LA, um, catch his breath and be with his, you know, get his affairs in order before he came out and shot with us. And he went back to Los Angeles and basically his doctor said, you ain't going anywhere. Got it. You need to rest. And this is now we're maybe four or five days away from shooting his scenes. Um, and so now you're we, starting to actually earn your money as a producer, aren't you? Oh yeah. So then I, you know, look at my Rolodex, whatever, whatever. I call. Um, um, and actually, I should back up. The first actor that we wanted to do it to play the role was a, a an actor who's a really good friend who actually did some stuff with me in some plays at USC was Michael T. Williams. Oh well, Michael T. Sure. And who you know, um, Bubba and Forrest Gump and. Gabriel in Fences on Broadway. And he, was in, he was in Heat with De Niro and Pacino. That's and... A phenomenal actor and a, and, a, and a phenomenal actor and even a better friend. So he was supposed to play the role, but Michael T works all the time. He got booked out. And as you do this in your friends, you'll find that you can, you know, you can't take food out of your friend's mouth. Sure, of course. <laughs> and so we're doing a little indie film and, uh, you know, he had to go make some real money, uh, which is fine. And we're still friends. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, uh, and so then, you know, then Lou and, and that, that happened with Lou. And then um, I'm friendly with Cedric, the entertainer. And, it, and each time you're doing this and I'm talking with Robert, you know, obviously the character shifts slightly. Mm-hmm. And Robert was also the writer of this screenplay. And so it's like, okay, well, if we get so-and-so. And so poor Robert is like having to <laughs> think through these machinations of what the tweaks would be while we're trying to get it cast. And so we had a, a, a one of the best dinners I've ever had with uh, Cedric the Entertainer, just filled with fun and laughs. And he was in New York already. He was shooting another series. And we were hoping and he was hoping that we could find a window, you know, that he, that he potentially could do both. And so we played with that for about 48 hours and that wasn't happening. And then I was like, Oh wow, we're really down to it. Um, I made a series of calls. One of them was a conversation with Michael T and um, we came up with uh, Glenn Turman and who, 
a pretty doggone good choice. Right. And um, so I called, we, I called Glenn, sent him the script. He read it. Um, he was shooting another film like in New Mexico. Uh, he, had, uh, he, had a, he had a window to do a couple of days and he jumped on a plane, came, shot the stuff. Phenomenal actor, phenomenal performance. Um, and you know how God does these things. Now you can't imagine anybody, I can't imagine anybody else having done the role. Exactly. Um, he, was, he was brilliant. You feel like oh, the, the gods, the creative gods lead you uh, to, to it. And um, uh, so Glenn did a, a phenomenal job. And, but we're literally shooting Glenn's last scene and the producers for the other film are on the phone saying, he's got to be back on that plane. And <laughs> <laughs> but and, you know, and, and you know, you know, and so we're but we're keeping it all calm. Yeah, you know, I'm going to the first AD. How are we doing? We got to get you know, but keeping it all calm for the actors. And um, so it was a blast. So yeah, long story short, so I was I was in the nuts and bolts, um, you know, uh, of of the physical production of it, but also you know uh, participating creatively. So, so, and you enjoy all sides of that. It's, it's not like there's a, you, you di dislike one element or another. You like it all. I, I like it all. And again, that's, I think that's part of the theater training, right? When, because when you're, when you're doing a play. You have to do it all. You have to. And you, and you, you know, and you, you know, you get into the scheduling and, you know, we're going to work this scene today and we're going to work that. And the sets are being built simultaneously and it's all sort of kind of got to come together. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I, I love it, including, you know, when Hollywood, I'm glad you brought it to keep things in context, the COVID-19, um, you know, when Hollywood opens back up, I'm enjoying and I'm having conversation with line producer friends of mine right now. How would we do it? Because again, you know, I have my indie film Paradise, which I'm hoping to gear up. Hollywood is talking about how they're going to do all the big movies. Mm -hmm. You know, so I don't have, if we do this indie film, at least currently budgeted, I don't have in the budget to buy out a hotel and quarantine everybody. <laughs> well, I, it's going to be really challenging. Sets are going to be really challenging until we have immunity of some kind or vaccine, whatever that would be. It's going to be really hard to have. I mean, everybody works on top of each other on a movie set. Absolutely. There's no space on a movie set. You can't have a cam a focus puller, um, you know, stepping away from the camera <laughs> by six feet. You, you know, so there's things that you can't have makeup artist not touch the actors. So, right. And you can't have actors in any wardrobe, kind of wardrobe has to touch the actors. Absolutely. Everywhere. And any kind of intimate scene between actors that, you know, you're getting in each other's faces, if not further. So right. it's, it's going to be a huge challenge. Um, and, and I think neither you nor I are going to solve it today. That's for sure. No, but it's, not. but it's going to be a gigantic but I, but to go issue. To your point, I enjoy, I enjoy thinking through that, those logistics, right? But, and, and I think that that's important for people to know that that's, you, you can't, have a problem or be afraid of uh, being able to get in the trenches and, and deal with massive problems as they come. What would you say is the biggest problem? Uh, maybe that was it. Maybe we just talked about it. You're losing your actor uh, four days before production um, and how you solved it. Is, were there other, was another big problem perhaps you could point to that was like, how do you solve this? And then you have to just do it. You solve it somehow. Um, no, I think, I think that was probably. That's a good one. That was a good one, and it, you know, and 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 also because you know, for any of your listeners who know production, that kind of thing impacts everybody. Oh, everything! Right? It just turns I mean, everything. Ward, wardrobe is coming to you. <laughs> I know we had the wardrobe for. Can you can you cast an actor who's the same size as, as Lou Gossett? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you're and you're having conversations about whether you need to flop production around so that you can shoot around the fact that someone's not there when they're supposed to be and it, Absolutely. it, it creates a whole hurricane and we and we and we had one of those there was an actor again who i just think is 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 brilliant and um uh i'm, I'm hoping has the career uh to demonstrate that a, 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 a another actor in our film um richard cabral mm. um and we had this very specific character uh of, of that helps our hero cross the border. And um, from day one, I was like, this is Richard Cabral. This should be Richard Cabral. And then we ended up with some scheduling problems with him 
Um, and we, we, we ended up flipping some things while we were shooting. Because we shot the film, we shot in Mexico, in Mazatlan, and we shot in New York. So I'm shooting my indie film. We're gearing up. We're getting ready to go. We're looking for locations. We're putting all that kind of stuff together. We're, we're budgeting and thinking about New York. I, my, my, my line producer, a gentleman named Butch Robinson, who worked with Spike Lee and all those guys, he's kind of got New York on lockdown. We know it's expensive. We've made the decision that, you know, we want the authenticity, right? You know, so right. we don't want to shoot in Canada for New York. We want to shoot New York. It's a 9-11 story. It's got to be New York as a character. Sure. Makes right? sense. And, um, and then we also wanted to shoot, you know, we looked at New Mexico, we looked at some other stuff, and then we decided we really want to shoot in Mexico. So we were doing that kind of stuff. Fred Weintraub passed away. I go to Fred's funeral. I'm catching up with people. And there's a gentleman named Eric Strait, who was part of this acting troupe that we took over to Lithuania when we were shooting one of the shows. He says, what are you doing, blah, blah, blah. And I said, I'm just getting ready to go into production on this indie film. Oh, really? Where are you shooting? I said, well, you know, we're shooting in New York and in Mexico. He goes, where do you, where, where are you shooting in Mexico? I said, well, in the script, it said, you know, specifically it would be Mazatlan. Uh, and he goes, oh, wow. I have a house in Mazatlan. I know everybody there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's you the know? gods. That's the exactly. Gods. And I just looked up in the sky and I said, thank you, Fred. You know, I mean, and, uh, you know, away you go. So. Yeah, those those things, uh, they're kind of miracles as they happen. Um, but they're, it, it's, I don't know whether you want to call it fate or destiny. It's really more probably fate than, than destiny. But, I, uh, but, you know, those things happen all the time. All right, so I want to turn a little bit. How sure. does a person produce the Democratic National Convention, for God's sakes? How does that work? Um, that came, that came out of, um, well, I mean, how I got there. And then, you know, then if you want to drill and I can try to remember some production stuff, but, um, um, that really came about because of some work I'd done in the civil rights space. Yeah. Um, and I had, um, produced a, it's, these are just like bucket listings. I produced a, a March in Washington in front of the Lincoln Memorial with 300,000 people. Oh, is, is that all? And, and all the <laughs> civil rights, the civil rights community and the, um, the labor community, kind of as my speakers and all that. They, you know, they brought me in, they were in a kerfuffle. Um, a woman named uh, Leah Daughtry, um, phenomenal woman. Um, she was in charge, kind of the point person on that. And then again, Ben jealous. And it was like, well, who do we know who really knows how to do events? <laughs> you know? you. And so they, you know, they called me up. And of course, you know, sometimes these things happen. They call you up, you know, it's like, wow, wish you'd have called me up like a year ago. <laughs> <laughs> so we did, so we did this March on Washington. Then anyway, so then flash forward, um, Leah is chair, uh, ends up being chair of the DNC. I think she's the only African-American woman who's been the chair. She chaired the DNC twice. And um, she remembered me. And she um, um, remembered me for, for a whole host of reasons. Because one of the things I do, um, and I, I, don't, I, I, I don't know quite why, but I enjoy, when I work with people, I don't, um, I'm not one of those guys, although I did it a couple of times early on when I would tell, you know, if I was the creative, I'd tell the producer, well, that's technically not possible. <laughs> <laughs> Just to get them up because you know, they didn't know enough. <laughs> Just so you could go and do what you want to do. But I'm very much of, you know, if they're interested, this is, this is why we're making these choices. This is how we got here. And you know, especially like in this kind of case where I'm like the, the, the producer, you know, I'm bringing creativity, but I'm also bringing, you know, logistics, right? And all that. And so, you know, help me. I need to know from you exactly what the messaging is you want to get out. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and, and so, and here's what I'm getting creatively. Oh, wouldn't it be interesting if we, you know, whatever, if we did this with minds instead of a speech, you know? <laughs> oh, 
Oh, just I would love up. to. See, I would love to see that sometime. The whole Democratic <laughs> National Convention done by mime. <laughs> you know, so um, <laughs> and so so Leah really appreciated and respected that that approach, and so so she was excited. You uh, you you like to lay things out on the table rather than hiding them. Yeah, some yeah, people do I, like to hide things. You know, no, I like to I like to just be very upfront and say here's. Here's what we're doing. Here's what we're going for. Make sure everybody's sharing the same vision. Right. You know, um, I call it, you know, and I was talking to somebody else just the other day, you know, I, you know, I call it onboarding people. Right. Oh, that's a, that's a neat term onboarding people. Yeah. You know, and, 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 and I find it, you know, I've got a call later this afternoon where, you know, we got an agency that's trying to package uh, or want, wants to be involved in a project and packaging it. And I noticed immediately they're trying to package they're not trying to package the same thing I'm trying to do. Right. So, you know, so I was like, and I told my partner, I said, we haven't onboarded them properly. That's, you know, that's, we a, need to go, that's a cool term, a, Vic. I like that term. You know, let's step back. Let's say, Hey guys, you know, this is so that everybody is trying to achieve the same goal. Right. It, 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 we're, the, the play is, you know, you're going to call a play. You want to make sure everybody knows where they're supposed to be on the field. So, right? so you weren't producing the TV end of it but you were probably involved in co a coordinated effort with TV people, correct? You're talking about on the and, DNC? And, and, the, and the DNC. Oh yeah, no, the DNC, it was the, it was the event side and it was the TV side. You produced was, both sides of it. I was in it, you know, well, and you know, I was, I, I, I co-executive produced with a gentleman named, and I was again, blessed here, Ricky Kirshner, yes. who basically had been doing the DNC for 30 years, <laughs> you know, so, so he knows it ins and outs and, and and he does a lot of those big events, and so um, um, so they brought me in um, one to have a new fresh voice in the in the room creatively, right? Uh, and you know, and then you know some logistics, but you know the reality is Ricky, you know he also does the Super Bowl, so you know he had a lot of that, but it was a lot of interfacing, and you know you should know on the DNC and the RNC the rules of the game are they circulate on the TV side um, um, so, that it, so that it cannot end up in the, the theory is, so it cannot end up being propaganda, right? Because right. a convention is a convention, right? There's real work being done there, real messaging, all that kind of stuff that they, they each network gets a shot at being the, the primary network that sets up the cameras, to capture it and then they feed that feed to all the other networks now right. when they cut away they can do their talking heads and fox can put their spin on it and cnn can put their spin on it and nbc can put their spin on it sure. but what is coming out visually what we as people get to see that's unfiltered unedited you 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 actually program that and they get the they must use it exactly Exactly. And so then you, you interface with, you know, um, you know, with the, with the political campaign on, 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 on the 2016, it was, you know, there was a, there was a point where at one point where we were programming potentially two different shows, right? Right. Because we didn't know if it was going to be Bernie or Hillary. Right. Right. And so when people even say the fix is in, I can say, well, they, they, there might've been the fix, but production didn't know about it right because we until until uh, you know until all the votes were counted and the whole thing and it, we, we we knew it was hillary we were going okay if it's going to be bernie it goes this way if it's going to be hillary it goes this way in regards to um um you know who the speakers would be how things might be laid out and all that you aren't involved in any of the in writing any of the speeches, are you? You're that's somebody else's. That's the candidate. No, almost, almost every almost every politician um, comes with their own speech. Yeah, comes with their own speech writing team. We did. Um, Do you have to vet it? And we and we had and we you know um, uh, in this regard, even the uh, once the candidate is in, they have their PR speech writing teams. So, but. You know, we, 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 we definitely, um, cause I, I was also, you know, one of my areas was like, of the, the, the interstitial right. stuff. And so those scripts are written, those intros are written. 
they're all then vetted by you know everybody uh, sure. on the political team to make sure that uh you know that the 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 messaging is 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 correct were you involved and, in in the videos that we see behind folks exactly exactly so you pull all that together right so, Th those things always look to me like massive organized chaos. Is it? Um, it they, yes. They, they don't, they, they're incredibly slickly done. And that one, they all seem incredibly slickly done for what they are. Right. They're, they're not as slickly done as they could be because there's all these other chaotic elements and all those humans that are there for days and days. And, 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 and you're also, um, what you think the messaging that you're calculating on day four, after you do day one and two, and you're starting to get feedback, it switches. It things can switch up. So, so I, correct me if I'm wrong. One of the hallmarks of what you're probably outstanding at that you have to have is the ability to flex. Absolutely. And and I would imagine that probably the biggest part of your job as a producer on pretty much anything is just being able to to shift gears and to uh, change into uh, to to fit whatever's happening at the moment. Yes. Yeah. No. No. Uh, there. There. There's. There's definitely a uh, um, a lot a lot of that. I and I. You know. Uh, again. Um, it's like you football. Know, you got to plan to punt. Exactly. Exactly. You know, you, and you, you know, and you, 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 you call the play and you know, doesn't work. So now you go a different sometimes direction. It works. Sometimes, you know, you got to improvise. As, and, uh, and you can't get stuck in what you wanted to do. You, right. you have you, to be you willing can. to flex. Right. No. And which is what I, which is what I love about, you know, live television. Cause again, with the image awards, you know, where I'm really credited, I was there as a kid um that's a perfect transition that's where i was headed right into the image okay. awards okay yeah because with the image awards it started there was a gentleman named hamilton cloud uh who was an executive at nbc and brandon tartikoff was the running nbc i think at the time and um and i really was a kid uh, this is something i started while i was still in college uh, working on this or just right out of college the um um it was a chicken dinner which Basically, all award shows start as chicken dinners. I right. Mean, the Oscars started as a chicken dinner. Right. Um, and uh, and um, mostly Tartikoff, mostly rub, rubber chicken most of the time. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, Brandon Tartikoff came and saw it um, at the behest, I think, of, of 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 Hamilton and some and the leadership of the NAACP. He went to the event and he thought, "Wow, this is really great." And I think he also recognized that it was a show, especially at the time. Um, that and and even still has a lot of cultural value in America. That was recognizing minority talent that was maybe not be, and their work that was not being recognized anywhere else. Sure, for a host of reasons of how people are get awards, um, and so it literally the first year of that show there were four of us. It was like four people around a kitchen table uh, was the the production and we um um we preempted um saturday night, they gave us the one night a year we preempted saturday night live um and so it, it started out as a you know, a late night special on nbc go years and years and years later i eventually end up um um as the you know started as a again Started out as a PA um, assistant talent coordinator, mm -hmm. um, end up then being segment producer, segment producer writer, then producer writer, then executive producer writer. So um, it was a, you were just another overnight success. Yes, you know, <laughs> and um, the my my real credit on that show because you know a lot of people brought a lot of creative creativity to help shape it and make it uh, the, the important um, cultural show that it is currently, Hamilton Cloud, Suzanne DePass, um, and then the leadership of the NAACP from Kwaisi Mfume and Julian Bond, right. a gentleman named Willis Edwards. Uh, but I'm credited with having taken it from, because we would, we would shoot it 
they call it live to take, right? We'd shoot it as if it was a live event, but it wouldn't air live. And right. then we would go back and we would edit it. And sometimes it was three days, sometimes it'd be a week, whatever, but you'd go in and clean it up and then you'd, you'd put it out there. But I'm, I was the first executive producer to take it live. And okay, so how did that, in, all right, so there, that's, uh, so you have to be cool under pressure. I absolutely, and, and that's where also I really believe that having spent all the time in the editing bay that I've spent, mm -hmm. because you're, you are literally editing on the fly. Right. Right. Sure. It goes back to what you're saying about being fluid, because you're looking at something and you're like, oh, wow, that moment didn't work out the way we needed to. We still need to get that piece of information in, okay, let's give that to so-and-so now, blah, 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 you know? And when you also, when you're doing live, especially on network television, not as much for a convention or something like that, you're literally sitting there with a clock that's telling you, okay, that first act was a minute under, <laughs> you know? The, the right. next act is three minutes over. And so you're also like, okay, because you got to go off, you know, again if you're the oscars or the grammys they give you some leeway but these other shows it's you know they're going to cut away to the 11 o'clock news yeah, you're you're done it'll you're at, done at 10 59 period on that frame right yeah. and so you're so you're doing all that all that calculus um and and, I, and again i credit my enjoying it and being good at it is you know from the time i spend in the editing bay so i'm watching it and i'm I'm, I'm, I'm editing it in my head as we go, as we go forward. And I'm like, Oh, well, don't worry. That moment didn't land, but I, so-and-so is coming up and you know, we're going to, we're going to get that emotion back in the house. All right. So, so what trick do you have if you have one for staying cool under that kind of pressure? Do you have, is it just, are you just naturally that way? Or do you, is there something you have to talk yourself through or you have to, how do you stay cool under pressure like that? Cause the pressure has got to be hellacious. Um, Preparation, preparation, preparation. Okay, good. You know, the one thing I can, you know, and sometimes, you know, it can slip into your personality while you're working on things. Um, you know, a producer, you know, and I, you know, I'm a writer director too, but let's be stand producing, um, is a problem solver, you know? And I say, you know, um, really, really good producers re, react you know and know how to react and i say really great producers brilliant producers anticipate and so when i say preparation preparation i literally i'm no fun to be around <laughs> last, you know because i'm i'm literally sitting there thinking about everything that could go wrong so you right? you've, you're you're wargaming all of the things that could go wrong every every aspect from because you know and you do these shows <clears throat> whatever you've got your tentpole moments right and so you know okay well if 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 from a convention we know we know we're gonna so and so and so and so is gonna give their speech and you know they're gonna be there for 10 15 minutes and whatever they do with inside that there's nothing we can do right. you know but when we come out of it what do we have coming up and is you know um and so it's the same on, on a variety uh, kind of award show. You know, you've got your performances, you've kind of got your big moments, you've got your special awards and all that. And so, you know, you're on the phone, you know, it's like, oh, I, I, can, give you, I can give you a story too, by the way, uh, um, to, to put it in clarity. Um, we did, uh, we were honoring Quincy Jones and Ray Charles was performing. And Ray Charles said, um, I'm cool. I have to be out by 8.30. <laughs> this is when we were doing the pre-tape, right? And, and then editing it. Uh, and I, you know, I'm producing. And so we're told like at eight o'clock that Ray is getting antsy because he's still just sitting in his room and he wants to be out by 8.30 and he needs to talk to the producer. Now the show is going on. <laughs> <laughs> so the show is rolling. I'm looking for when is an opportune moment that I can leave the show to go talk to Ray. Oh, and, you know, when the talent executive is coming down going, no, Vic, he's real. <laughs> you know, uh, Quincy Jones is now backstage because he's getting ready to go on to give his speech. And, uh, you know, and, you know, you pull talent 
event early and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm like, um, um, Mr. Jones, you know, with, with Ray and blah, blah, blah. I mean, do you want to go up and say hello? <laughs> He's like, no. <laughs> <laughs> He goes, you know, this is this is all yours, baby. <laughs> so I go up and I talk to, to I, I I I talk to Ray, um, um, who was really just a really a charming, obviously beyond talented person, human obviously. being. Obviously, um, and uh, he says, look, you know, he goes, I can't control. He says, I understand you can't control your time, but I can control my time. <laughs> and, and I'm leaving at 8.30. And so then I run back down. This goes to the point of the, the question. I go back down. I say, okay, guys, we got to flip the next act. Wow. We got to bring up Ray. <laughs> Ray's up next. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we're going to this next commercial break. When we come back, we're, we're, going, to, we're, we're going to Ray. Oh. And everybody, you know, and you, you know, your scripts are marked. So it's like, you know, whatever. So we're going. Okay, we're moving on to item forty-seven. <laughs> <laughs> and and, the pro and probably the audience, both the the local audience and the home audience, had no idea. They have no idea. They have no idea the the the, the gut wrenching chaos that's going on. Well, that's that's the, that's what I was getting at earlier. It is organized chaos, but it's chaos, and you have to keep control of that chaos. Yeah. Otherwise, if you so got out of control, you'd be really in trouble. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and, it, and it's at those moment, moments you have to be so decisive, right? Because because obviously everybody pushes back, right? And you have to go. No, we are moving on to item forty-seven. How, how does all that then relate to you as a director? How I mean, directors prepare, have to prepare, prepare, prepare. But you prepare from for. Uh, from a different perspective, different right. point well, of view. This is, and again, this, you know, you, you'd be the paperwork in front of you. And, I, and I'm just saying like item 47, because then the director, everybody, the, 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 your lighting cues, your sound cues. Everything's off. Everything, everybody's, everybody have, we've rehearsed, we know what's supposed to happen in item 47. You know, now nobody's thinking we're gonna go from item 30 to item 47 right we're going to go to item 31 and yeah you know, work your way up but when you go item 37 everybody just flips and so the director so he knows what shots he's looking for in item 37 and you know away you go there might be you know and then obviously whoever's doing the uh the the intro there might be you know some language you know obviously you can't reflect back to something that didn't happen you know that kind of you know, kind of stuff, but you know, it's, and again, this is the preparation, right? It's organized. So, you know, in theory, um, again, I love sports analogies. I, 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 I try not to use them because they sometimes may be gender-based, but it's like, you know, you, you, you call a play, if you use football, you call a play, you see how the defense, now, you know, you may have called in three plays ahead, and all of a sudden you see how the defense is responding and then you call and you go, no, 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 no. We got to throw in this other play. Absolutely. You know? And, and, but because everybody has rehearsed and practiced and all that, you can do that, that flip. And I'm just, to me, I'm always in awe, right? I'm in, I, you know, cause I've, that's not the only time I've had to do something like that. But when, you know, to see the, lighting designers and the sound guys and the stage managers and everybody just kind of go oh get to that page and like okay no 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 and then like no you stand here for a minute well i need you and the dead <laughs> and it all and going, going 43 steps back in this conversation <clears throat> all of those people that you're relying on in that moment all of them are longtime professionals or have been at it a while. And none of them did you draw off the street that afternoon and say, here, you sit here and run this lighting board. No, these are all people that know exactly what they're doing and can handle that kind of quick oh, turn. Absolutely. No. And we, you know, we, I, I'm, I'm sure we've probably all been to shows where, as you were saying, the audience has no idea what's going on, where it comes to a grinding halt crash. Oh, <laughs> and you're oh, like, oh. I, oh, something happened. <laughs> I, I, I will not go through my, my litany. 
<laughs> I, I, I've been through more than my share. Like, oh, how, how do we get out of this? Right, right, right. <laughs> and I'm sure that's what you're talking about is how do we get out of this? So you have to figure your way yeah. because, because the, the, the beauty part of it is, is that you really don't have a choice. You can't just say, Hey, I give up and go home. <laughs> right. You right. know, you, you tough it out, you figure it throw, out. Throw, throw your hands up. Yeah. No. Yeah. And it's, so it's, um, um, and I actually, what's, what's the line from all that jazz? You know, I tell everybody when we, you pull that off, I go, yeah, the rest is waiting. I mean, I'm like, I look at people, I go, come on guys, you know, those are the kind of moments you, you know? because otherwise, you know, if it, if it just went so fluidly, it's kind of like, uh, you know, it's a yawn. But, but those, but those moments also make you, you, they, th those are the moments that people who work with you remember you for, they don't remember you for those yawn moments. They right. remember you for how you solved the impossible problem. And I've also found it's interesting too. You know, I mean, again, you don't want it, but you do those kind of things. And I'm and I'm sure every producer, executive producer of any major event will tell you. Sometimes when you do those kind of flips, the adrenaline that also goes on stage mm -hmm. creates this magical energy. I, you know? I agree. I think. I mean, so. Ray Charles's performance was phenomenal. You know? Because he was he was the thoroughbred waiting to come out of the gate. Exactly. And he kept waiting to come out of the gate. And he, when he finally came out, it was like, here it is. Right. Whereas, whereas if we had, and I knew that that performance was, again, it was one of my tent poles, right? And let's say I could have convinced him to not go on until nine o'clock. Right. Then he comes out and he's like exhausted and yeah. tired and his mind is somewhere else. and you know and you and 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 he's a professional so he would deliver but you would something subconsciously you would sense you know well i guess the other the other thing that you'll you'll never know is he probably knows himself well enough or knew himself well enough that this is what i need to do in order to have my peak performance yeah. it's got to be now not later not not at two o'clock in the afternoon it's now absolutely and, and that probably contributed greatly to it um We've been talking for a well over an hour, believe it or not. And oh, wow. uh, yes, we have. Yes, we have. And so we're going to sort of wind this down a little bit. Yeah. And uh, all right. So in all of your experiences, we've already heard a bunch of really great examples of this. But do you have a, anything that you can think of that's like a quirky, weird, oddball, strange, offbeat, or just plain funny experience that you can share beyond the ones you've already told us? Yeah, no, I, and I was thinking about that, and I'm kind of glad. I didn't know those other ones were going to come up, and so I'm, I'm glad they did, so I'm off the hook for, for that. Because <laughs> um, a, 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 a moment which was a pivotal moment for me, and I know we focused on producing, which is fine, because yeah, I, I, I really think at some levels, it's, it, again, it's a, it's, a, it's a base for, you know, if you're a director, if you're a writer, if you don't have some sense of producing of how do I get in the game to get things done, you know, I mean, because that's how I say how I, be, I became a producer because I was a writer. I think I told you, I wrote absolutely. My first while I was at USC, and I had a, an office on the Fox lot. I had an office on the Universal lot for like two or three years after I graduated, and I was writing a lot and I was making decent money, but nothing was getting produced. And at one point, I said, "Hey, you know, I cannot produce my stuff as well as anybody else. So <laughs> why don't I maybe better?" Video? Why don't I learn how to produce? And I re and this is how I got started on the Image Awards, by the way. I reached out to some friends. And um, the only friend I had who was uh, producing, who would give this young kid a shot at producing, was doing this variety show. And he said, well, come on over. You know, you know I'll teach you how to produce. And, uh, and uh, you know, and so, so that's how, again, I got in the variety and the event side of things. Um, so the, 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 the story in that sense is, um, and again, it's, it's, it, it's not funny or, or, or humorous, but I think it's, it's important in that, um, you know, you have these tentpole performances and, and this can actually lead to people if they want to go see it because it's on YouTube. Um, I really wanted Prince to perform on the Image Awards. Okay. And... Um, the network obviously really wanted Prince. Everybody wanted Prince. Yeah, everybody wanted him. And um, so, you know, I'd done the reach out and, you know, and we'd reached out in past 
years and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, and we wanted to honor him with the Vanguard Award. And so, um, so he called, or so my talent exec comes running in my office, Prince is on the phone, Prince is on the phone. And I think, okay, Prince's person is on the phone, yeah. right? Um, and, and, I, and I said, well, so, so who? And he said, no, 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 it's Prince. And he only wants to talk to you. And so, of course, then I'm like, wow, okay, because I'm a Prince fan on top of everything else. Sure. And I take a, a deep breath. And the thought that goes through my head was, and this is what I want to share, I thought, don't be a producer, be a human being. Yeah. And I have no idea why that thought came into my head at that moment. I'm not going to say there are other times in my life where I've just been, you know, and I've even told people there's a certain amount of showmanship that goes with being a producer, right? Yeah. Including, hey, I got this all under control. <laughs> and you're like, <laughs> oh my God, this ship is sinking. Um, <laughs> just be a human being. Don't be a producer, be a human being. And um, picked up the phone, Prince. We talked for not quite as long as we've spoken, but we, you know, spoke for a good, uh, well, maybe a good, you know, 90 minutes into wow. two hours. And all we talked was production, um, well, not even product, creativity, philosophy, art, religion. We were just all over. It was one of the best conversations I've ever had. And one of the things that he told me that I've never forgotten, which I've actually used creatively, um, which was this will dovetail into my kind of closing thought, I guess is um he said look he goes i'll be sitting with record executives and they all will tell me what my next album needs to be mm. and he goes and i look at him and i go well if you know what it's supposed to be why don't you go do it <laughs> yes <laughs> you know he goes because i know creatively what's in me that needs to come out you know you may know what you would like to sell whatever but you know you're i'm not a commodity and so and then because of that um um prince and i remained friendly until the the the, the day he passed away he would invite mm. me to all his concerts anytime he was in town he had if he had a a party or an after party um he he did an after party he did perform on that show again you can find the the, the, the clip on online the negotiation was he told me he said and again this is before we went live he said um i'll perform he said so toward the end of the call he goes so vic you know, so you want me to perform i said yeah that obviously would be honored and he said okay i'll perform but i want 14 minutes <laughs> you know well and you know in television a three four minute performance <laughs> is 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 what they're looking for and he said he said so can you give me that i said yeah, you got 14 minutes. <laughs> and so I hung up and then I, you know, and everybody's like, so is he going to perform? Is he going to perform? I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, but he told, you know, he wants 14 minutes. <laughs> and and well, I, I commit to it, hang up the phone. My, uh, I'm the executive producer now. My producer, my talent executive, they're like, oh, is he going to perform? Is he going to perform? I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. But he says he wants, uh, he wants 14 minutes. And they said, well, you didn't commit to 14 minutes, did you? And I said, yeah, I, I, I told him. You know, <laughs> They said, well, you're going to, you know, the, the network will never allow it. Are you going to, you, you know, you, 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 you know, you have to tell them. And I said, I said, yeah. So I pick up the phone. I called the network executive. I said, you know, you guys wanted Prince, right? They said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, well, we got him. Hey, <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> you know, and they go, but, but, you know, but he wants 14 minutes. And they said, oh, 14. And I said, and I told him, yes. They said, wow, 14. Okay. Well, but we'll, we'll edit it down to eight. And I said, no. I told him he could have 14 minutes. If you don't want to give him 14 minutes, tell me and I'll call him back and tell him the network <laughs> doesn't want 14 minutes. Uh -huh. I'm going to give, I'm going to give it, but I've told him he gets 14 minutes and they said, okay, okay, but it better be 14 because it better not stretch and <laughs> stretch. All, you know, all that kind of stuff. Right. So we put the performance together. Prince comes in during rehearsal, closed rehearsal. 13 minutes, 59 seconds. 
<laughs> he, he was the music director. I mean, it was like, he was, and then I got to work with him a couple more times. He was such the phenomenal professional. Every moment, you know, every glance, every, you know, it was a, a, a dancer, right? It's like, this is the move right here, right now, in this time, on this beat, on this note. He's, you know. He was extraordinary. You're saying he was extraordinarily precise in what he was doing. And he, and of course, clearly all he had to do is watch any Prince performance to know he was the consummate professional. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, that, and, 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 and for me was always a, a delight to work with. So, but at the core of that, like I said, don't be a producer, be a human being. I think that that's, that's really great. Uh, uh, so the last question is, do you have a, a good piece of advice or a tip for somebody trying to break in. Is that it? Or that my, my tip, which extends to be a human being, is don't wait to be discovered. Discover yourself. Discover with, yourself. How, how, well, okay, elaborate on that. Know, what do you mean? You, you've got to know who you are. What is your voice? What are the stories? Everybody's, everybody's looking for POV, right? For voice. If you want to know what is your POV? Because you can look at any story, right? Mm -hmm. And whatever you know, the way, um, and, and you're a creative too, you know, the way you might do, I'm trying to think, you know, Camelot would, uh, you know, the, your approach into that story would probably be different than my approach into the story. Of and, the somebody else. and so what you have to do is discover yourself. What is it that you are uniquely bringing and why is it important? And then that will also lead you to what stories you feel you have to tell. Mm -hmm. And you need to go in with that passion um, constantly. I, I think that's, that's phenomenal advice because um, I think a lot of people are trying to serve somebody else or some other thing. And the, the thing or person you need to serve is you. Absolutely. And now that's, now there's a, I, I will say there's a caveat on that for me because I did a lot of TV writing. And when you're working on a television series, you are serving a certain thing that isn't you. That is, i.e., there's a, somebody's already set up some kind of a sandbox that's called the show. Yeah. And you need to play in that sandbox. But you should be bringing your voice to that sandbox. Absolutely. But yet you're Absolutely. still within the parameters of whatever has been set up by somebody else. Yeah, no, and it goes back to what I was saying even earlier, you know, when it's like, okay, what is the messaging? I'm, I'm here, I'm, I'm as a producer, whatever, creative, you know, what is the message you're trying to get out? And let me interpret that for you. Right. And, and, and bring it. Because, and, and to go to your point, I've never found, and if other people I've spoken to, you know, if here's the sandbox, and if you're not coming and bringing some fresh toys and some different kind of energy and a different thing, it's like, why do I need you in the sandbox? Right, exactly. You know? Exactly. You, you need that shade, that flavor, that tone, whatever it is that you're bringing to it, your point of view, your, your sensibility, all that's, uh, that's very good advice. It, that most people starting out are trying to serve something else. Right, or they're, or they're looking at it and they're like, you know, whom, whomever it is, you know, I want to be, I want to be Spielberg. And they're doing, especially depending on where you are, if you're young enough, you know, it's like me reading, Shakespeare and Ibsen and um, August Wilson, right? You aspire to that, but you need to be inspired by that and not just, oh, I'm trying to win the who sounds the most like Ernest Hemingway writing contest. <laughs> Yeah, please don't sound like Ernest Hemingway. <laughs> well, we've, I've been talking for the last, I've, I've kind of lost track of time here. It's almost, you know, 90 minutes with uh, Vic Bullock. Um, and it, this has just been a phenomenal time here, Vic. The, Thank you, the, Steve. I've enjoyed it very, very much. The <laughs> amount of, yeah, the amount of stuff that you have to say that's so important and so um, vital for people who are trying to do this thing called show business, whatever that is is fantastic so i can't thank you enough for being on the show today no thank you thank you for having me and so we've come to the end of today's story beat if you like this podcast please take a moment to give us a rating or review on whatever app or platform you're listening to your support helps us bring more great story beat episodes to you until next time i'm steve cuden and may all your stories be unforgettable